Welcome everyone to a new webinar on CAPE. Today's session will focus on child exploitation investigations and how CAPE can collect, uh, can help find, collect, and triage artifacts to expedite your investigation. We'll hear from the creator of CAPE, Eric Zimmerman, who is a leading expert in the field. For his contributions in fight, fight the, fighting crimes against children, Eric was recognized with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's Award in May 2012. And in 2013, he received the U.S. Attorney Award for Excellence in Law Enforcement. Before we switch to Eric, a few housekeeping items. Um, the session will be recorded, so you receive access to, to the full recording in a couple of days. Um, and we are welcoming, we welcome your questions. You can ask questions via the GoToWebinar client using the chat function in your screen. And we'll, uh, Eric will stay on to answer as many questions as possible um, within the allotted time. Finally, before, um, before I switch to, to, to Eric, if you're interested in learning more about CAPE and want to secure a CAPE certification, we have two upcoming live virtual sessions. These are small group sessions with ready access to Crow experts, as you can see on the screen. Uh, and with that, let me switch the presenter role to Eric, and he'll kick off the presentation. Eric, all yours. All right. Hello, everybody. Let me get uh, my screen shared here. So um, what my goal is in this session, obviously, we, we don't have a, a vast amount of time, um, somewhere between a half hour and, and 45 minutes or so with questions. Um, and so I want this to kind of be a quick preview of what you can do with me driving it, but I also want to allow for you to ask questions on, well, hey, how would I make it do this? If, if I don't get to something specifically, I want that the, the feedback from the, the attendees so that we can make sure we're getting the questions answered that are going to help you move the ball forward. Um, and, and really, that's the, the most important thing here is this is going to be kind of a a drinking from the fire hose type presentation only because of the limited time we have with this format. But um, as you're going to see, we don't need a lot of time to, to get started with CAPE, um, especially with how I'll do it. I'll just use the graphical interface, uh, which makes it even easier. Now, the thing that we need to start figuring out up front and laying the groundwork for is, well, what do we want to collect? What are we trying to show? And so if you've done child exploitation type investigations, you're going to be familiar with, of course, all of the keywords and, and just for, uh, for various reasons, we're, we're not gonna get into specifics. We're obviously not gonna be looking at any questionable material. It's gonna be more of a generic looking at some images in this live machine, it's just a VM that I have. But of course, you can use your imagination and extend that into how you're going to be able to figure out all of the other kinds of stuff that your particular subjects are doing on their machines. Now, most investigations, we want to focus in on a, a few key things. What documents have been opened? Pictures, movies, PDFs, Word documents, websites. We want to focus on what directories have been opened because that's maybe where their contraband is being kept or where they're accessing files from, where they're downloading things to. And so there's, of course, going to be certain key artifacts that we can focus in on in order for you to be able to make use of the data in the most efficient way possible. Um, I have a couple people in the question saying no sound. Um, I haven't heard anybody else in the chat mentioning that, so I'll just assume that it's on, on one person's side and we'll keep going. But if anybody else uh, can't hear me, obviously you're not gonna be able to, to acknowledge that you can or can't hear me if you cannot hear me, but I hear a bunch of people saying they can, so that's a good thing. Um, we'll see what we could do to help them out here as we go. So with that in mind, like as I mentioned, I have a very simple Windows 10 VM here. Um, and so CAPE is going to be a tool that will allow you to do things on scene in a triage capacity on an end user's machine while it's running, or it's just as capable if you were to have it offline against an E01 or a right blocked hard drive. And so while we're not going to get into uh, a lot of the specific types of scenarios where we have a hard drive that we found and the computer that's on. You'll see me demonstrating some of these things, 
and I'll point out some of the ways that you can do this. Now, keep in mind, again, what we're trying to do here. I am trying to figure out the most important things in my case as quickly as possible. And if we're talking about time and speed and needing to look at 10 machines and figure out how to prioritize, one of the things that we're probably not going to do is take full E01s before we start looking at computers. Now, if time doesn't matter, time doesn't matter. If you have three days before who cares about the first question, take all the time you want, create your E01s, and then I'll show you how you can access the E01s from there, okay? Now, because of my background and what I did when I was an FBI agent and with the Utah ICAC, um, people are familiar with a tool called OS Triage, okay? OS Triage is somewhat similar to CAPE, but if you wanna think of CAPE kind of like OS Triage version four, that might be an interesting way for you to think about it. Now, the, the thing that you need to keep in mind, the distinction between OS Triage and CAPE is that OS Triage is a very specific tool for frontline investigators that is going to try and present a wide range of data in a very similar look and feel, right? If you've used OS Triage, you have the grids and it's the tabs and everything's kind of in a grid and you just, you look at all the stuff in one place. CAPE is going to be a little bit different than that. CAPE is going to expect you to know what you want to collect and what you want to process. And so because of that, if you have somebody that's brand new to forensics or to an ICAC task force, handing them CAPE and saying, have at it, that might not be the best approach. If you have been around a while and you know what you want to find or you're the senior forensics person and you can pre-configure CAPE to do certain things for you, that might be where someone who's a little bit less up to speed, they're newer, they don't have the background in forensics, might still be able to make use of CAPE, but it's not going to be the same kind of look and feel as far as what the output is. And we'll see some examples of that here. Um, in a second. Not that I'm going to run OS triage, but you'll see examples of what this output looks like. Now, CAPE is going to be relatively small um, in and of itself. CAPE is a command line tool at its heart, um, but the wrapper around the GUI program or around the command line tool is a GUI program called GCAPE, graphical CAPE. So that's where we're going to start. Now, before I open that program up, Notice here, this is what our installation of CAPE looks like when you get it from the website. Now, depending on when you get it, uh, if you downloaded it yesterday, great. You're gonna have the most current stuff, but let's say you downloaded it a month ago, three weeks ago, six months ago, a year ago. You may want to get the newest version. The easiest way to do that is this script right here. And so to get updates, you just right click run with PowerShell. And if there's updates, it would get those for you and unpack them. Now, I didn't have any updates in this case, so it went away really quick. Notice there's a change log and you can get all the various um, stuff that's that's been updated as things happen and I add features or fix things and whatnot. So that's always a good thing to check when you get a new version. Now, the targets and modules folders we'll come back to, but that's the heart of CAPE. CAPE doesn't do anything by itself. CAPE is driven by targets, which collect files, and modules which run programs. And what makes CAPE so capable is that you do not need to rely on me to make CAPE do what you want. With very little work, you can extend, and I'm gonna do this in a minute, you can extend CAPE to make it work exactly the way you want, to collect exactly the files that you want, no more and no less. That is getting back to that idea that I mentioned earlier where CAPE expects you, the user, to have a deeper understanding of what you want to collect as opposed to show me all the stuff and I want to know about hashes of interest and keywords and it's yellow and it's red. We're not going to have that same type of thing here. So let's take a look at what the interface looks like here. I'll spin up GCAPE and then we'll kind of walk through and take a tour here. So we have two sides. We have targets, right? And you can see how things enable when I click the box. So targets collect, modules run programs. We'll come back to the modules. Now, there's several things that we need to do here and you, that we need to supply, and you can see that they're in red. 
So a target source, in other words, where is the data that you want to collect? Now, in this case, I'll just say that we want to collect stuff off of the C drive. I'm going to run it on this running machine. We don't have to do that. And in a minute, I'll do it against a mounted E01 that we'll use Arsenal Image Mounter to do. Now, the destination, this is, well, where do you want Cape to put the stuff that it finds? And so I can say something like C colon backslash temp T out. Now, notice here, I've already used this in the past, and it remembers these things that I've picked in the past. So if I wanted to, I could just click on one of these, and it will populate it in there. Now, notice as I'm interacting with things, several things down here. One, this command line keeps changing to reflect what a valid command line would look like should you decide to, at some point, use the command line tool. And if you're going to scale this, I would expect you to use the command line tool versus trying to do it all in a GUI. Now, notice that we cannot click execute over here in the lower right. That's because we haven't met all of the requirements. Notice here it says targets. One or more of these is required. So now think back to what I said when we started. What are we trying to show here? It's, it's always going to be a good thing to think to yourself, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Now, what do I mean by that? Just because you can collect 87 different targets doesn't mean that you necessarily should, right? What are you trying to show? Now, in our case, why are we here? We're talking about child exploitation stuff. So it may be interesting for us to do things like well, how about jump lists? If we say link files and jump lists, now what are link files and jump lists? Those are gonna be shortcuts and pointers to documents, pictures, directories, and things that somebody has opened. And so I did several things there. One, I filtered, and then I checked the box that I want to do for a selection. Now, another thing that's always really interesting in almost every type of case is, what has a user been running? What programs have they been running on their system, evidence of execution. So one of the artifacts that will tell us about evidence of execution is prefetch. And so now, if I get rid of that filter, notice down here, it tells me that the targets I'm going to collect are link files and jump list and prefetch right here. Notice that the execute button is ready to go. Now, before I kick this off, what we're going to see in a bit when I make one of these custom targets, we may run into problems. We might not get it just right. Now, I don't, I don't anticipate that to happen with these built-in ones, but CAPE is going to do a lot of work for us to make sure that the customizations that we build are going to work for us before we need them. In other words, when we make them and we test them, we're going to get feedback right away whether or not something works or it doesn't. Now, part of that would be after we click execute here. Let's see what happens, and then I'll walk through actually what happened here now it's already searched, the, the search is over. I am done with my triage. Now you might say to yourself, come on, you're, you're, that, this is some kind of fakery, you're, you're speeding up time. Nope, that's real. That's the kind of features and functionality that you are going to be able to have in the field to get answers to your questions, essentially in real time. Look at how little time it took for me to iterate the entire 60 gig drive 0.091 seconds it knew about all 185 files to find. Then it copied them all and deduplicated three. Now it's going to calculate the SHA-1 of every file that it sees. And by default, it is only going to copy out a single instance of each file based on the SHA-1. Why? If you had 38 files that are the same, I don't wanna give you 38 files that you have to look at. You only need it once. Now you can certainly turn that off. But by default, you're good. This is it. It took three seconds to do that triage. Think about your user experience when it relates to doing your own forensic exams, taking it to your lab uh, internally or to the RCFL. How long does it generally take for you to get answers as to what documents have people opened? What was their browser history? Think about the types of questions that you ask yourself and you're like, man, if I only knew this. What could you do? Do you think that from an interview perspective, you could wait, oh, I don't know, three minutes for your forensics people to do this and then tell you 
Here's what this person has been running. Here's where all of their files are. Here's what he's been opening in recent days and so on. Now, what have we done here? All we've done with this is the collection. Now, remember where I collected it to, temp, T out. Now look what we have here. First of all, we collected it from the C drive. So if I go in there, notice what it started doing. Now, prefetch lives in C, Windows, prefetch. And so there they all are. There's the actual prefetch files copied and all of the forensic metadata preserved. All these timestamps are not today, right? Unless they were actually accessed today. For example, you could see here, this one's 9-1. CAPE is going to preserve all of the metadata about the files. Now, if I go into users, Batman, app data, roaming, Microsoft, Windows, recent, what do we see here? Link files and jump lists. It's collected all of those. You didn't even have to know where they are. Kate knows based on the target that you give it, how to go about actually processing it. Now this console log, this is everything that was done that went across the screen so that you don't have to, like if it's scrolling really fast, you don't have to wonder what was found, when it was found, how long it took and so on. If I open up these other two files, I'll just open them up in edit pad. Notice what we have. The, the copy log is the source file where we got it, the destination file where we put it, the size, the SHA, created on, modified, last access. Look at the full resolution, 64-bit Windows file times. When deduplication enabled, does the output CSV identify the duplicates that were identified but not exported? Excellent question. That is the skip log. It's almost like I asked Jesse to ask that question. So in the skip log, notice what it's saying here. It's saying, I did not copy this file, local disk drive and recent, because that particular link file, one was already copied. Now, does that mean that you do not have a copy of that file? No, you have a copy of that file. Which file is it? Well, if I take that SHA and we go find it, and I just modified that, so let me do that again. There it is, right there. That's the file. Notice it was just a copy, okay? So when we deduplicate, it's not just some blind, oh, I'm just gonna drop it, full audit, everything that matches. So let's say this was a picture uh, of you know some um, series. Now we're going to have all of that information about the fact that this person had these series pictures in 10 different places. Will it run against the machine or an E01 with multiple user accounts? Absolutely it will. Absolutely it will. It's going through things and you're gonna see exactly how it does that in a minute. Is there logic to determine which duplicate to keep? No, first come, first serve. Does the duplicate only look for the file hash or file access? It's the hash only. It has nothing to do with the timestamps, it's the contents of the file. Can Kate be executed from an external hard drive and results? Absolutely it can. That's how you typically would do it. You plug in Cape from an external SSD or a USB drive, and then you run it from there against the C drive. Absolutely. Does it run faster on images or expanded drive? Depends. How fast is your drive holding your E01s versus how fast is the, the mechanical drive or the SSD that you're running it on? Um, faster is relative. I mean, going back to this, if this took five seconds, uh, that's not too bad, right? Now I'm gonna do that in a minute. I'll run it against the mounted drive. Uh, and I'm going to get back to someone else's question. Well, what if we had more than one profile? Notice here, if I close this, let's, let's take a step back and take a look at what CAPE actually used. We'll get to your question there. Um, can the output be wrapped in a second? So what did I do? Well, I opened up, and chose link files and jump list and prefetch. So I'm going to edit these right now. This is what defines what we collect. Notice how simple this is. Prefetch, windows, star, which means you're gonna get windows and windows old, prefetch, and then get me everything that looks like star.pf, okay? For link files and jump lists, Look at how it's slightly different. Now I'm gonna zoom in on something here just to highlight this. Do you see everywhere where there's yellow there? Well, somebody asked the question, 
Is this going to allow me to collect data from multiple profiles? Absolutely, because you can specify using wildcards or variables, users star, which would then expand out to all the user's profile on the box, and you're gonna get everything recursively. And I'll show you what that looks like when I mount this E01. Somebody asked a question about pictures and videos that have been encrypted by the user. If they're named with the extension still, you're still gonna get them. Now, if they're renaming uh, all their pictures to .foo or you know, .docx and they're really JPEGs, well, no, you're not going to be able to extract those out unless you look for Word documents. However, the link files and the jump lists are gonna tell you what's been opened. Most, I don't know that I've ever had a case, and I've worked plenty of cases, where somebody has been renaming all of their files to get rid of keywords, series information, even renaming files based on their extension, super rare in my experience. You'd still be able to get it based on the file name, recent documents that have been opened, and that should pivot you there. Since we are giving the exact path, why not use a wildcard for all extension? Well, that just depends. Why, I would need a more concrete example there why you'd want to use a wildcard. Could I make CAPE extract out every single file on the entire hard drive? Absolutely. Should you do that? No. That would entirely defeat the purpose of triage. Does CAPE require administrator? Absolutely it does because it needs to do raw disk reads and everything else. Can you collect memory? Absolutely, you can. And that gets into our second topic, which is modules. Modules. So let's take a step back and go over to here, okay? Now notice, this was the collection piece. But watch what happens when I turn on modules. Notice here I have other things that I need to do, and I also need to tell it where I want my data. Now, what did I collect over here? Recall that I collected link files and jump lists and prefetch. Well, I know over here that there's parsers for prefetch called I should have just filtered for it, but PECMD, -E that's my prefetch parser. Now, how about link files and jump lists? JLECMD and LECMD. Now, watch what happens here. Recall what we did before. I only collected, but watch what happens when I do this. Now, I'm also going to modify this slightly because somebody asked a question can I shove all the stuff that I collect? into some type of a container. Yes, you can. Would you like all the forensic artifacts you collected dumped into a VHDX or a VHD or a zip? You just select the relevant option here and let's call it a uh, demo, okay? Now watch what happens. Now we're getting a warning here about, hey, there's data in the T out folder. That's okay. All this is telling me is it's gonna delete everything from T out so that I can't cross the streams and then commingle data. You could imagine how bad that would be if you did that. Now watch what happens here. Nothing new here. This is the same. Notice right there what it's doing though. Look at what it just did. Now it took me an astounding 5.9 seconds, but look at what it did. It ran three programs that understands how to extract out every nuance of detail from link files, jump list, and prefetch into CSV files. And look what else it did. If I go back to my temp folder, look at what's in T out now. A single zip file. If I extract this, look at what we have in there. A folder, of course. That's just the way I did it. But there's a VHDX. Watch what happens when I double click it. Oh, it mounted it as the E drive. And there is all my stuff. Guess what? You could pull this E drive into X-Ways. You could pull this into Axiom. Do you know how much, this is a rhetorical question. Do you know how much faster Axiom and other tools are gonna process this data when you pre-filter the stuff that you're gonna look at anyway with, with CAPE? Orders of magnitude. There is no option for an L01, that is proprietary. It'll never happen. You can do a zip, right? Zip's done. So that's not an issue at all. Recall, if I go back to here, you could do zip, VHD, or VHDX, no problem. Um, I would recommend that you do VHDX because everything should support that without any issues. Now, another note. If I'm done with this, I can just, of course, eject it. What is this? Think to yourself. I mean, obviously, type it if you want. 
what is this, this zip file with my VHDX in it? That is your original evidence at this point, right? That should be something that you never touch. In other words, don't extract out this VHDX and then delete the zip file. The zip file is always what you collected. So notice what I did. I took a copy of, I extracted out a working copy and I could now work against this. And if I go in there and something gets goofed up or I change things or delete things or whatever, I have my original right here. Now, more so than that, look at what's in M out. Okay. File folder access. Remember what I said before? What types of questions do you want to answer? I want to know about what files and folders were accessed. I want to know about what programs were executed. Well, look, there's your jump lists and your link files. So if I bring these into Timeline Explorer, in less than 10 seconds, I know every single file that was open, right? There's everything that I've opened on this computer in automatic destinations. There's all of the link files that I was open. Now, what would you do here? Here's where you could start searching for all of the very, and I'm not going to mention them just for OPSEC reasons, all the various keywords that you normally would associate with child exploitation cases. Is it possible to contain and mount the artifacts in the read-only mode? You could if you want, but there's no reason to. There's no reason to mount the VHDX read-only, and you must mount it read-write the first time so that Windows can initialize the non-file system part of the, the VHDX. I would not worry about mounting it read-write or read-only. read, read only. It's not necessary. You always keep a copy of in that zip file of the original. It doesn't matter if you mount it um, read-write. Um, I'm just catching up on questions here. You said CAPE extracts artifacts with intact timestamps, but then you're suggesting using ZIP for export when ZIP tends to rewrite attributes. When, well, it depends. There's going to be pros and cons to both approaches. That would be something you'd want to test. It, either way, either way, remember, inside of T-out, inside of here, look at what happens now in the VHDX. The copy log is always going to have the original timestamps no matter what. So it isn't like these things, even if they do change, you have a record, okay? You have a record. Does CAPE require antivirus software? No, it does not. The only time you're potentially gonna get in trouble with antivirus is if you're trying to run a certain module. Because remember what modules do, modules run programs, okay? So I'm just catching up on questions here. Let's see, can you load a word list in the timeline explore and process your output against known terms? Sure, uh, that's kind of getting away from here, but you could certainly build up um, a list of questions where you would do something like um, P PW and notice how it filters there. Well, let me turn that off. I got to get another example. Let's say I did S delete. Well, I can go in here and then do another or. So I could say relative path contains this or this or this or this. You can get as crazy as you want. So there's all kind of ways to go in here and filter this data. But again, all of this stuff, this is gonna, this is a little bit beyond the scope of what we're what we're doing here um, with just using CAPE. Is it possible to do this remotely on multiple targets? Absolutely. And there's a whole bunch of people that have written stuff up. Uh, and so if you want to look at that in more detail, you'd have to go look at the CAPE docs and the tips and tricks and things like that. And we also um, talk a little bit about that. There isn't any built-in automation because everybody does it slightly differently, but yes, it's absolutely possible. Um, let's see here. I'm just going down my questions. Is it possible? Okay. How can, CAPE, how can CAPE output be presented in court to assure chain of custody? It is no different than any other forensic program you've ever used. How would you do it if you used X-Ways or N-Case or OS triage? You collect this. It's on a thumb drive. You put that into your case. In my case as an FBI agent, I would have written a 302. It would end up in a 1A. It would go into evidence. Whatever that is, you're good to go. Okay. Uh, let's see here. If you add your own custom file to the set of target files, will it collect and display? Yes, it will. I will show you that in a minute. That's where we're going to be well, kind of driving toward here in a minute. Uh, we're using CAPE via EDR and remote feature. Great. Okay. That's good to hear, BA. That's good feedback for people. Could you add a parser for Sysmon to be more easy? Done. That's a great question. You guys want to see how easy event logs are? This is going to blow your mind. This is a bonus. Watch this. I want event logs, right? There they are. Now over here, I have to actually process the event logs, right? 
So EVTX ECMD is my event log parser. Watch what this is going to do for us. I'm going to run it. Now, while that's running, oh, that's got, I got a file open. Stand by. Notice what it said here. It couldn't delete it. Okay, that's cool. Thanks for letting me know. Try it again. Uh, something's still open. Let's see here. Oh, I know what it is. We've got this uh, image mounted. So I'm going to just unmount that image. And now let's see if we get it to work. There you go. So what am I doing right now? I'm collecting event logs. But guess what? On a running system, event logs are locked. You can't just go copy them, but I just did, right? Because I'm using raw disk access. So if a file is locked, registry hives, anything, boom, you got it. Now, check this out. This is actually running and processing out all of the data. Event logs. What, who's done event log analysis before? Think to yourself, yes, I have. It's horrible. It's tedious. It's boring. I got to remember all these 4624s and everything else. Somebody asked about Sysmon. Now, I don't have Sysmon on here, but guess what? I have maps for Sysmon. Watch how easy this is. What do you want to know today? Boom. I don't have to remember anything. You want to know about administrative logins or a user successfully signed in? How about services installed? How about scheduled tasks? Do you want to know about RDP sessions? Find the description. There they are, right? How about 4624s? Process tracking. Event log, service, started, stopped, user logged in, WMI, you name it, it's here, ready to go. It is going to, Sysmon is already in here. There's maps for it. Okay, this is going to be so much better for you than any other tool that you used, I think, um, because of these maps. Now, that again is a whole nother webinar in and of itself. So, um, for now, we're going to defer that. Now, somebody asked the question, well, yeah, but how can I collect memory? I'm glad you asked that because if we go in here and I do something like, oh, I don't know, win PMEM, there it is. Check the box, it's going to work. Now, watch what happens. I'm not going to collect event logs again, only because it, it can be a little bit slow. But before I do this, notice what it says right here. Process VSCs. Anybody ever deal with volume shadow copies? Anybody want to go into those shadow copies and extract out all the goodness without having to manually mount them and move around? And, and OK, check the box. Check the box. Now let's see what happens. I don't know if there's any volume shadow copies in this VM, but there is in that E01 that I'll mount in a minute. Watch what happens here. No volume shadow copies. That's cool. Oh, look what happened. Oh, we've got a file open in there. Let me get rid of that. We're in the in the event logs folder. That's why I like to do prefetch because it happens pretty quick. Now, one thing that I do, I'm doing this on purpose. I want you to see what happens when you try to run a module like WinPMEM. Okay. We're going to have an issue right here. Cannot find the executable WinPMEM. It's not where it expects it to be. That's because by default, all of these modules are not going to exist by default. In other words, I am not going to distrib distribute the executables for a module. You are going to have to go get that executable and put it in the right place. Why? So that you could make sure that only what you want to run is going to be possible to run. If I did it, or we, I allowed other people to put these into the default distribution, you could imagine how fun it would be if somebody did a module for S-Delete that just starts deleting the entire C drive. You would not be happy with me. And so there has been work that's gone into making sure that everybody is as safe as possible when it comes to using this as well. Can you save different profiles? I would recommend that you use the command line option, Brett, for that. That's the whole point of this down here. You guess what's going to happen if I take this, copy it, and then go into a PowerShell window? What do you think that's going to do? Exactly the same thing that I just did, except I'm not using the GUI now. So if you want to come up with Certain profiles just keep a record of the different command lines, and then it's just copy paste, change the T source, and everything else, and you're off and running. So it's going to become very, very easy for you 
to interact with these things. Now, one other thing you can do here, if you double click, you can edit these things right inside the program. Notice here, there's WinPMEM, there's all your command line options. Now, again, because of our timing, this isn't the full half day course where we're teaching you how to do all this stuff in detail. We offer training on how to do all this stuff and we do expand it, but even as fast as I'm talking, it's already 135, right? Is this tool available under GN GNU license? Basically, we're allowed to use this in a commercial environment. You cannot use this if you charge somebody else for your work. That's the short version. So if you're the government, if you're co a cop, if you're the military, go for it. No charge. If you want to use it internally and you work for one of the big five firms, you're, you're fine. But if you're going to use CAPE and then charge your client as a part of that engagement, you, as somebody mentioned, you must buy a license. And if you want to know more about that, you can go buy it on the website or you can send an email to cape at kroll.com and we'd be happy to, uh, to talk about those kinds of things with you as well. Going back through here, making sure, has there been a Dalbert Fry hearing on CAPE? No, but guess what? Software doesn't sit on the stand, right? There would never be a Dalbert hearing on CAPE because you're not going to put a thumb drive with CAPE on the stand. Guess who's going to be on the stand? Me. Me, right? I can tell you this. OS triage has been around for a long time. Probably I'd have to do the math, but I would say at least 10 years now. I have never once had to testify as to the forensic um, accuracy of that software. And I know it's been run probably 100,000 times plus on systems. So I don't know, there might be a Dalbert Fry somewhere, but again, it's not the software. It has no bearing at all in court what software you use. If you can justify why you did it, what it's doing, and of course demonstrate the fact that it's not like adding evidence or changing something crazy, you're gonna be fine, right? So this, this kind of gets back to that whole notion of, oh, it's on the approved tool list, it's okay for me to use, is it? If you can't explain what it does, you're gonna get hit on the stand pretty good. Because at the end of the day, people testify, not tools, right? So. Um, you are going to be called to be an expert. What you use to get the data doesn't matter. Can you validate that the data is the same if you use other tools? Absolutely. And I would expect and hope that you would do that in your own at least somewhat minimal validation of this. Don't take my word for it. Like the old saying is trust but verify. Now I can say that countless people have beat against this and anytime that anybody finds an issue, of course I'm gonna fix it very very quickly but from a collection perspective you see how fast it is from a collect and process you can be ready to do the analytical work think about this what percentage of files in a typical e01 do you think you really look at when you do a full forensic exam when somebody gives you an e01 what percentage of the stuff in that image do you think you really look at 20 percent 10 it's, it's about one to 3%, okay? Why do you wanna spend your time collecting in an E01 the 97 to 99% of stuff you're never gonna look at when you can get answers with this by focusing on the one to 2%, 3% of the data that you want and getting the, the analytical product that is now sitting in front of you to start answering questions within minutes. If a kid is missing, if a bomb's gonna go off, if some other major issue is happening, this is going to be a game changer for you. Even just, I'm not saying you're ever, you're gonna replace forensic imaging with this. This is going to supplement it. Before you kick off your E01, run CAPE against that mounted hard drive. You're gonna have everything you need. File system, pictures, Word docs, all of these things is going to be available for you very, very quickly. Now I'm gonna exit out of here real quick and I'm gonna start a program called Arsenal Image Mounter. Arsenal Image Mounter is a tool that allows me to mount an E01 and it will emulate a physical disk, okay? Yes, it'll be posted. It'll be available for you. Um, I think somebody already posted that information. Let's see, early on you mentioned you would show how to bring in an E01. Bam, that's exactly what we're doing right now, Jesse. So you have returned at the perfect time. Do I have someone to take my place? What do you mean? Like if I get hit by a bus? Uh, I don't know, I guess that's 
that's the, the the risk you take. I mean, there's definitely plenty of forensic people out there that contribute to this program. No, there will not be a Mac and Linux version of Cake. Um, it's just too much to try and, and emulate or, or maintain three code bases. But if you can get access to a Mac and or Linux file system via Samba or a file system driver on Windows, all you have to do is point Cape to it. It's going to work exactly the same money, right? And guess what? People have already written targets to collect Windows subsystem for Linux and other things like that. Well, Cal, your question about who's going to keep the software up, it's a it's a Kroll product. So other developers at Kroll could take it over. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball to know, you know, kind of what that looks like in one, two, five, eight, ten years. But um, obviously, I hope nothing happens to me. Um, but Kroll has the source code. We have developers. Um, the targets and modules, even if I never released another version of Cape ever, the targets and modules are all open source. And so you could just continue to write new targets and modules and Cape will work. That's why it's so nice, because it doesn't matter if the executable doesn't change. It's just the config that, that needs to be changed. You are just creating text files. And I'll do that in a minute. Now, here's Arsenal. So I have an easier one. And I'm going to mount it. Now, if you've never used Arsenal Image Mounter, this is the, the in quotes only, this is the tool you should be using to mount E01s. Don't use FTK Imager. You are not going to get access to volume shadow copies if you do. OK, notice what this did. It says that there's two shadow copies on the E drive. Now, watch what happens. Remember what I did before. All I'm going to do now is change it from the C drive. BA says, can I run targets on one machine and run modules on another? Yes, you can. Check this out. Module source. See what happens when you just check use module options here? You would put where's my data. This is your T out or your destination generally, right? And then where do you want the output of the modules? So yes, you can collect on one, pull it over, do all your analytical work on another machine. Absolutely, totally flexible. Now watch what happens here. I'm gonna use the E drive, T out. Now on this one, let's get a little bit more complicated. Let's take a look at this basic collection. Look at all this stuff that we're gonna collect, okay? Event logs, evidence of execution, file system, link and jump list, PowerShell, recycle bin, registry hive, schedule tests, SRUM, thumbs cache, USB devices, Windows index. All that stuff's going to get pulled in. So let's just see what happens. Let's just see how long this takes against an E01. So the search is over. I've already located 634 files and I'm 35% of the way through collecting it. You can see up here at 60%. Now, while that's running, I'm going to go back to temp, T out. Okay, there's some locked files. Now, this is going to be the file system stuff. Under what circumstances would you mount an image and read, write? I generally will do read, write only because then it allows me to for tools to take ownership, right? And then um, it basically is a way to fool Windows, right? If you mount it read only and you try to go into a directory that you don't have access to, Windows is going to be like, nope. But if you click the allow button, then it's going to allow you in. Of course, the easier one doesn't change, but Windows has no idea it's cached, which is why it's awesome. Okay, now look at that, 30 seconds, bam. Cape is already in several SANS courses, uh, 4498, 4500, I believe, and 4508. So it is already in there. And uh, in fact, all of the data sets for 4508 collected via Cape. So that's kind of cool. Now look at what's in T out here, boom. There's our E drive. Somebody asked about multiple profiles, there they are, right? No wondering where stuff is. Right, all of the data, there's the MFT. I can do all my MFT forensic stuff right with this. And if I wanted to dump all that out to CSV, just do the modules, okay? But now let's go back here again. Remember I said VSCs? Check this out. All I did was check a single box or add VSS switch. Now watch what happens. Look at that, two volume shadow copies. Remember it found, I don't know, 300 or some files. Watch this. In a second, it's going to figure out all the stuff it's doing. Okay, it didn't like that target, but there it found 1,800 files in 10 seconds, including everything through the volume shadow copies. It is now going into the primary C drive. Kevin's asking how come it took 30 seconds? Who's got that kind of time? 
I would expect that kind of question from Kevin. And I was wondering if he was going to be on this call, uh, this this webinar, purpose specifically for this purpose of harassing me. And he delivers as usual. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm wor always working on making this faster. Um, but keep in mind, this is on a VM as well, so um, your mileage may vary. Now, look what we did here. I found 1,800 files. That's way more. Why? We targeted the C drive. Look what it's doing now. It's going into the file system, into the shadow copies, and look what we get now. E, MFT, boot, log file. Look at this. Volume shadow copy one. Volume shadow copy two. These are all of the things, of course, that were different. How about old copies of registry hives? How about old copies of link files, Word documents, anything else that you could imagine, this is going to get it. Now that one took me almost 58 seconds, okay? But again, slightly faster than months, okay? Does your get only contain targets and modules that you wrote? No, anybody can publish those targets and modules. However, I am the only one that can accept a, a PR, a pull request. So if you make 10 really amazing targets, uh, well, it looks like we got to do a two-question two, que two question warning here just from our time perspective. Um, we're, we're just running out of time. So, yes, if somebody did a, a target module, they would do a PR. I would then look at it, make sure it's not crazy, and then I would accept it in there. That's a great question. Check out this right here. You see this sync button? Let's say Jesse spends the next three days making 15 new targets that are just mind-blowing. Well, I accept them in. You shouldn't have to go out and wonder, how do I get these targets and modules? Watch what happens when I click sync. It goes out. It found all, look at all these new targets since the last time I updated. Usenet, MFT Mirror, Debian, WSL stuff, Slack, Snagit, Viber, Mattermost. All of these things are now available to you to collect. There's going to be more things here for you to collect. And this, I'm not saying this to, you know, like to be offensive, then things you probably never even heard of because people are submitting stuff all the time. And I'm like, never heard of that one. What is that? And then I go look into it. It's like, I can see why that'd be useful, right? That's why this is nice because you get to choose exactly what is going to be pulled in here. All of that stuff that we just pulled in here is now going to be available. Check this out, P2P. There's all the stuff for peer-to-peer -peer clients. DC, Gigatribe, Shiraz, Soulseek ready right you don't even have to wonder where those are fire and forget this is what i want go get it for me put it in this folder and if you have a parser for it it makes it that much easier now you might say to yourself here as we're wrapping up i want to show you one thing specifically well yeah that's great but i want to be able to collect images videos you know jpegs pngs and so on i didn't see a pictures and videos in there Okay, but look at what I have in here. Underneath the disabled, these are these are just examples. Notice what we can do here. This example says I want to look at the root of the C drive. Now we use C as a placeholder, but that will be replaced with whatever your T source is. So if you said E, it would be E and so on. But notice what this says here. I want you to look for star.zip anywhere it exists on the C drive. Okay. Now, what if we, just as our last example here as we wrap up, let's just do, we'll just make a new one, right? Let's see how easy this is. So I'm going to go in here, and instead of zip, I'm going to say JPG, okay? Now, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just leave this from a timing perspective. I don't want to have to, you know, change it a bunch of times. So look at what I'm doing here. I'm going to change this one to MP4. BMP. How about doc X? Just to get crazy, right? We could make it as, as nutty as we want. Now, if you're a super nerd, look what you can do. You can get insane and use a regular expression that will match on 87 different things. But by default, normal human beings, we like star dot something. I want to keep it simple. So now going back in here, let's go in here. Now we called this picks. Uh, of course, I have things other than picks in there, but you get the idea. Let's go to my E drive. We'll go to my normal place, picks. There it is. And let's run it. Let's see what happens. So, note it's iterating the entire image right now. Okay. 
It's going through and looking for all of the JPEGs, MP4s, bitmaps, and docx files. Now, are there ways to make this a little bit faster? Yes, and that would be where you'd use the regular expression, only because it can it can evaluate and go through the file system once as it's finding files. So these kind of full directory walks might take you a little bit longer, right? But it's a trade-off. If you don't know where somebody's keeping things, this might be something if you're just like, I want to get all of the contraband off of this system. There you go. I found 925 files across every single thing on that image in 34 seconds. Now, how much data is that, you say? Well, while that's copying, you can see it's already 80% done. We'll tell, I'll show you how much data I just waded through. There you go. Less than a minute, 50 seconds, I went through and found everything that I just defined. Look at all the stuff. Didn't matter where it was. It found it, it pulled it, it rebuilt the directories, and it applied all of the original metadata to those files. Is it possible to, extend, to send artifacts to another system via SSH or the cloud? Are you guys reading off of questions to ask? Because check what you could do here. Transfer, boom. Transfer options. Want to send it to SFTP? Done. Any S3 provider, AWS, Oracle, IBM, Google. How about Azure? Done. Guess what? CAPE has a built-in SFTP server. So you could define your own, check this out. I could spell it, right? This is an example of a config file for SFTP. If you run CAPE like that, CAPE will stand up its own SFTP server and then you would start another instance of CAPE, pointing it at that server that you just stood up, and it will shove all of your data over to that SFTP server. And when you're done, you just stop the SFTP CAPE instance. Everything's great. You've, you've stood it up. You've used it. You've shut it down. You don't have anything insecure sitting out there for any length of time. So great question. You can push to any S3 provider. This says AWS, but the next version, it's, it's pretty much any S3 um, this looks easy to integrate into Splunk. Well, it's not so much that CAPE integrates into Splunk. What you would want to do in that case is deal with your M out, right? And then ingest your CSVs. So you would use, like, think of it like for Elk or um, uh, Soft Elk or Elasticsearch or whatever. You'd use Beats or something like that where you look for files and you read them in and you do a map. That's what you'd want to do here. Um, now, I don't really have time to get into all this other stuff. But if you wanted output in JSON or HTML, you can do that as well, assuming, big if here, the command line tool understands how to export your data into that format. All of my stuff does. So if you wanted the MFT, you're done. Can you search files with a hash set using CAPE? You can tell CAPE to ignore certain files with hash sets. You can't say only look for certain kinds of files. Now, before I make a liar out of myself, let me just check that. Uh, I'm just checking to see one of these that's in here as far as, there's also a simulate mode if you wanted to like test things without really copying everything. I know there's, there's dedupe in here based on a file that you can provide. Yeah, I'd have to look at the specifics. There's so many options. Uh, Oh, there it is right there. So if you had a path for SHA ones to exclude, right? I, I don't want these, then you could provide that, but it's not going to be, here's the files and only the files I want to collect. Okay. When will the new version of KP out for those S3 providers? Eh, the, the new version with all of the S3 providers, it's probably going to be either version 1.0 or 9.4, 9.5. Um, I would say here sooner than later. I just was wrapping up a couple of the things that people sent in. So very soon. Um, it, it supports S3 right now, but all the providers, it's going to be the next update. Um, could you search for, oh, we did that one. Can you collect cloud data? What do you mean by that? Do you mean things like cloud storage? Like all those? Absolutely. And that's done, right? OneDrive, Google Drive, Dropbox, Box. This supports um, reparse points, symbolic links. 
all those kinds of things. So yes. Now, keep, what, what's one thing you need to be aware of if you're collecting cloud data? Does your search warrant allow for it? Are you legally authorized if you touch a file that's in the OneDrive folder and OneDrive starts downloading it from the cloud? Are you okay? You should be because your warrant should specifically say that if that happens, it happens. Now, uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, I tried to talk as fast as possible. There is no version between the LE and paid version. So um, with that, with five minutes left, I'm going to turn it back over to Leo to give you a little bit of uh, outro, if you will. Um, I, I really am happy and glad you guys uh, were able to attend. I hope that this drinking from the fire hose has been useful. Um, you know, the, the, we, we don't do these things to kind of point you to other things, but if you wanted a much more in-depth training, uh, we offer that, right? And and we, uh, we we work with law enforcement all the time and we're happy to support it. So um, please take a look at those other opportunities if you really want to do a much deeper dive. Feel free to email me, call, whatever. I'm always happy to help, especially for, for people carrying the torch here with this kind of training. So with that, I'm going to be quiet and turn it back over to Leo to take us home. Thanks again. Um, Eric, thank you. This was uh, amazing. And, and I feel bad having to tell you to stop, but we are, you know, 20 some minutes over time already. Uh, thank you everyone that joined. Thank you for all your questions. You can see on the screen right now, there are two uh, intensive training sessions for CAPE coming up. These are live virtual sessions. So if you're interested, check it out. There were some questions about licensing. Um, all those details about the enterprise license for CAPE are available on crow.com, or you can email cape at crow.com with any questions. And with that, we'll wrap. This session recording will be available within 24 to 48 hours, so watch out for the email. And thanks again.